is going to suck. I'm making a complete fool of myself. I'm not smart enough. I don't work fast enough. I'm not attractive enough, not extroverted enough, not funny enough. I don't even know why they hired me in the first place. I'm just curious how many of you in the room, or those of you remotely, have had a thought, something similar to those negative thoughts I just shared recently run through your mind. Yeah, so negative thoughts are part of what it means to be human. We all have them. We all feel inadequate and doubt ourselves at times. Um, many of us are really skilled at imagining those catastrophic worst case scenarios that are going to happen as a result of the choices we make. Um, and all of us sometimes worry that other people are thinking the worst about us. And negative thoughts can sometimes be helpful. And I think it, at times they can motivate us. Uh, they can get us to really sort of roll, up our, roll up our sleeves and dig our heels in to pay attention to it's like a threat or a problem in our environment that we otherwise might miss. But sometimes negative thoughts are just flat out unhelpful. I mean, they can even be, be painful. Um, you know, sometimes I think our, our negative thinking really gets us to pass up opportunities where we otherwise might grow and learn. Um, and I think, at the worst, negative thinking can sabotage our success. Um, and I think one of the things about negative thinking that really makes it toxic is that it, it operates in the privacy of our own minds. And so if, if we let it, it causes us to struggle in a way that we can easily do alone. Um, just like every person I know, I've struggled with negative thinking through different parts of my life. Um, perhaps you know, one of the biggest of those times was when I was around 19 or 20. Um, I was a graduate of a public high school, you know, used to being top of my class, and then all of a sudden was in, in an environment at an elite East Coast college just trying to stay afloat. Um, I was on the rowing team when I was in college, and during my junior year, my coach noticed that we really weren't winning our races. Um, actually, I bet he probably noticed this before my junior year, because we had been losing for a long time. But this year in particular, he decided to do something different about it. He, he introduced us to a handful of techniques in psychology. Um, he taught us to meditate. We tried out different exercises in visualization. Uh, we read a bunch of sports psychology books that taught us how to get our mindsets in sort of a, an emotional state for peak performance. Um, and the goal of all this stuff was to get us to row better and to ultimately win races. So that upcoming season, our rowing team lost all of our races. But I noticed that there was something inside me that was beginning to change a little bit. Like Every time I went to the boathouse for practice, our workouts seemed just a little bit easier. I mean, like they weren't any easier, but they just felt more manageable to me. And even outside the boathouse, you know, when, when I was just getting ready for exams that were coming up or had to write a big term paper, I was noticing that the stress I felt leading up to those was just a, a little bit more manageable. Um, and I actually started implementing some better study habits, I think, as a result for the first time in my life. <clears throat> um, and when I was going to class, I noticed that I was actually able to, to focus a little bit more sharply on what the professors were saying to me. Um, so the, there was... Something about what my coach did in those interventions that sort of allowed me for the first time in my life to take control over my own thinking. And to be honest, like I personally just fell in love. Um, in the sort of the decade and a half since then, I've sort of spent my entire education and career learning and teaching people the skills of positive psychology. So I've gotten really curious about what does it take to be the kind of person who exhibits optimism and resilience? And, and how do we teach those abilities to people who maybe don't do it as naturally? Um, so what I want to share with you today are, are a handful of techniques that sort of bear from the science um, in how to overcome negative thinking and build optimism. Um, I'm just going to say up front, we're going to cover a lot of different things. There's you know, a handful of different skills and strategies we'll talk about today, um, partially because this is not a, a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, I think some of the strategies we'll discuss might work great for some of you, and they're just not going to work at all for others. 
Um, so I think one of the keys here is to kind of just digest this stuff and maybe play around and experiment and ultimately find what works for you, okay? Um, before we talk specifically about negative thinking, I just want to sort of review how our minds work in general. So the cognitive model, um, sort of really made popular by Aaron Beck, a psychology professor and therapist at the University of Pennsylvania back in the 1960s, um, sort of laid out this sort of basic operating procedure for our minds. So there, there are external events that happen to us. Uh, I mean, things are happening to us all day, every day. You know, we come to a talk over lunch. We get a text message from a friend. Our alarm goes off in the morning. And there are you know, significant events that happen across our lives, too. We, we get promoted. We get married. You name it. So in response to those events that are happening all day, every day for us, you know, we have, on the right side, a set of behaviors and emotions, responses to these things. You know, our emotions can be all over the board. Maybe sometimes we feel ecstatic or amused by something. We might feel irritated. Um, Maybe we have feelings of bittersweetness in reaction to things. And our behaviors can you know, take infinite forms. You know, we can reply back to a friend, a funny one-liner. Maybe we spend the rest of our day sulking and complaining. Maybe we recognize an increased heart rate and breathing rate that's getting us ready to take immediate action on something that's happening in front of us. The cognitive model so it makes the assertion that all of those responses, the emotions and behaviors that show up as a result of what's happening in our life, are not directly coming from the events themselves, but are coming instead from our thoughts. So that how are we interpreting the world and what's going on around us? Right, so let's just say on Friday of this week, you come into to work and your boss asks you to take on an extra task. You know, it's an external event, something that's happening to you. Now you might think to yourself, what a jerk. She knows I'm too busy to do this. And if that's the way you're thinking about this, you know, you're going to have a set of emotions and behaviors that sort of follow from that. The same thing might happen to somebody else who might think, you know, I'm the only one that she trusts to do this right. And I think you can imagine that the emotions and responses that are going to follow from that kind of thought are going to be quite a bit different even though the event itself was exactly the same, okay? Um, now, psychologists have done a lot of research to help us understand the ways our thinking really work. Um, so one of the things that, that uh, Marty Seligman, who's done a lot of work in this cognitive model, also at the University of Pennsylvania, has researched is how people respond in their thinking to adversity. So when a bad thing happens to you in your life, do you tend to focus on the ways in which you maybe contributed to this bad thing happening? Or do you focus on how much effort it's going to take to deal with this thing? Or maybe how it's going to just like ruin your plans for the upcoming weekend? Or are you somebody who tends to focus more on the resources that are at your fingertips? You know, who can you turn to for support? Or what are the things that you can control to make this bad situation a little bit better? Or if not better, at the very least, more bearable, perhaps. And this sort of dimension, how we think about bad things happening to us, is, is sort of what psychologists define as optimistic versus pessimistic thinking. Um, so it, this is a spectrum of thinking styles. I mean, all, all of us you know, have a tendency to probably think more on one side or the other, but we may also vary depending on the situation and the event at hand. Um, but generally, when we look at pessimistic thinking styles, you know, when a bad thing happens, when we're thinking like a pessimist, we tend to see adversity as threat. You know, we, we sort of immediately focus on what's going to go wrong, how this is going to hurt us. Whereas an optimist is much more likely to see opportunity. They, they might sort of label an adversity as a challenge that, that should be risen to, an, an opportunity to prove ourselves and, and how we can overcome it. Pessimists are more likely to notice and expect the bad just generally. So you know, when a pessimist is reviewing maybe how the last week has gone, they're more likely to just sort of stop and focus more on the bad things and the stressful things. Whereas an optimist is, is better at noticing and expecting the good, sort of reflecting on the things that, that are maybe the more fortunate parts of what's happened recently. Um, and pessimists in their response are more likely to ruminate 
You know, to just have negative thoughts sort of spinning around and around without taking action, getting stuck in a pattern of thinking, to isolate themselves. And, and when they do act, pessimists are more likely to act in a way where they're misapplying their effort. They're not really tackling the source of a problem. Um, whereas optimists are more likely to act on what they can control, to find those sort of little nuggets and spaces where they can do something. And where there are things that they can't control, they're more likely to accept that and just remove on from it. Um, now, why does this, this matter? Uh, so there's a lot of research on the difference between having a pessimistic versus an optimistic thinking style. Um, I mean, first off, being an optimist tends to feel better, leads to more positive emotions generally. But there are, are a lot of research studies that I think sort of break down into two major categories, sort of health and success, where optimistic thinking styles do a lot for us. Um, so first off, on health, um, a handful of studies have shown that, that optimistic thinkers tend to live, on average, about seven to nine years longer than the most pessimistic thinkers. Right? A, a huge difference. Um, optimistic thinkers tend to have stronger immune systems. So they've, they've literally done studies where they've brought people into a room. They know whether you're more optimistic or pessimistic. And they, they actually sort of sprinkle into the room like a rhinovirus, something that's going to give you a cold. And what they notice is that the folks who think more optimistically, I think you have to sign some waivers first to take part <laughs> in that study. The, the optimistic thinkers um, not only get sick less frequently, but when they do get sick, the duration of their illness is shorter. Um, and I think some of the most profound results in the power of optimistic thinking come in studies on cardiovascular health. So there have been a number of studies looking at things like, uh, like risk for heart disease or hypertension. And so the, the general form of these studies is like this. They, they take a group of people, maybe men in their 50s, for example, who are otherwise sort of fairly healthy. Um, and they track these folks for a period of time, say 10 years. Um, along with their tracking, they know, again, who the optimistic and who the more pessimistic thinkers in the group are. And when they compare the most optimistic to most pessimistic, they tend to find rates of about two to three times more cardiovascular problems. So diagnosis of hypertension, actually having a heart attack. And when I say two to three times, I mean, so I'm literally saying a 200 to 300% increase in your risk of developing cardiovascular problems as a result of having a more pessimistic thinking style. Uh, on the success side, um, I mean, they've studied everything from productivity to educational success. It turns out that, that optimistic thinking styles are a better predictor of college GPA than your high school GPA. So when they sort of account for that, you tend to do better in school if you're an optimistic thinker. Um, they've done research studies with insurance salespeople, where the, the most optimistic of the group um, have sold about 88% more insurance, almost double, than the pessimistic thinkers. Um, and there was a neat study done of uh, a, a, an elite college swimming team, sort of athletes who were trying out for the Olympic trials, who were asked to swim their best event by the coach. And the, the coach was sort of in on the research study. All the athletes didn't know. The athletes swam their best event. And when they finished, they were given the time. But the coach tacked on just a little bit of time. Uh, so they were given false feedback, basically enough that the athletes felt like it was a failure experience, but not so much that they, that they didn't believe it. They sort of bought in, like, wow, I obviously didn't swim that as well as I thought I had. So they gave the athletes about 30 minutes to go rest up, sit in the locker room, do whatever they were going to do, sort of in their own heads and thinking, and then come back and try again. And the most pessimistic athletes ended up swimming, oh, I was thinking 1.6% slower which may not sound like a lot, but in the world of elite swimming, I mean, that's the difference between winning a race and, and not even being close. The most optimistic athletes not only swim faster than the pessimists, they swim faster than they had on their first attempt by, by a slight margin. But basically, you would ask them to swim their hardest 30 minutes ago, and these optimistic thinkers perceived a failure. And there's something about the way an optimistic thinking style works that that failure turned into fuel where they were able to get back in the pool and actually swim a better event on their second try. Um, so there's clearly a lot of reason to have a more optimistic thinking style. Now, I, I'm guessing there are some of you thinking, well, wow, I'm a pessimist. Like, I guess I'm totally screwed here. But that's not at all true. Um, it turns out that in terms of you know, different psychological traits, this 
this thinking style of pessimism to, pessimism to optimism is one of the most learnable and teachable traits in psychology. So if you see yourself as maybe being more on that pessimistic side of the spectrum, that's fine. You, you can learn to do what an optimist does in response to adversity. Um, and the rest of the skills we're going to talk about here today are ultimately about how do you take the skills that natural optimists use to handle and face negative thinking. Um, so there are four main strategies that I want to review with you guys and just share some tips about that optimists use to fight their negative thinking. Um, first is to assess, um, you know, to take a look and evaluate the negative thoughts before we let them control our behavior. To distract ourselves, I mean, literally just to divert our attention to something else. To combat the negative thoughts, uh, to tackle it head on and fight back against it. And to distance ourselves from our thinking altogether. So to just start off, um, assessing our thoughts. I mean, is this negative thought something to overcome? So I think it's really important to know that not all negative thoughts are created equally. Right? Some negative thoughts are really helpful for us and absolutely necessary for us to, to navigate in our worlds. Um, like let's say you get an email tomorrow morning that reminds you that you were supposed to send in a contribution for your team yesterday and you had totally forgot. Now you might think to yourself, holy crap, I completely forgot about that. My team must think that I'm not pulling my weight. I need to get this done, ASAP. I mean, that, that's a negative thought. It doesn't feel comfortable to imagine that your team is seeing you as somebody who's not pulling your weight. But hopefully, the guilt or anxiety or whatever you feel as a result of that thought is getting you to immediately focus on getting that thing done and emailing it out. Right? So there are absolutely times when our negative thoughts are cueing us into what we need to focus on and helping us take action. Um, but I think there are also a, a lot of negative thoughts we have, and the, the ones that sound much more like the I'm not good enough, that, that really aren't helping us in, in any productive way. Um, and I think a lot of these thoughts that aren't helping us are at times you know, when we, we sort of view the events that are happening to us in that cognitive model, and our thoughts and interpretations about those events are a little bit twisted or distorted. Like we're, not, we're not seeing the world completely accurately. Um, so I want to just talk through a few of these sort of common patterns in which we sort of distort our interpretation of the world, and we're not seeing things accurately. Um, so cognitive distortions is, is uh, sort of a term and a list uh, also developed by Aaron Beck, the father of cognitive behavioral therapy. It's sort of, he sort of found these commonalities in ways that our thinking tends to go awry. I mean, the handful I have up here are just a few. There are, there are many others. Uh, but these, I think, sort of illustrate the ways in which our distorted thoughts can really get in our way. Um, so overgeneralization is when we take one event and we sort of assume that everything else is going to play out just like that. Right, so maybe it's your first day on the job, and you have a, a few awkward social interactions with people, and you start to think, I, I'm never going to make a friend here. Right? I mean, that, that thought is not at all true. You're just taking your experience in this first day and now blowing it out to assume what the rest of your career is going to look like here at this company. Um, all or nothing thinking, you know, where you're kind of doing a very black and white division of the world. Either things are one way or the other, there's no gray. Like let's say you're in a performance review with your supervisor who tells you that you're, you're meeting expectations and that your response to that is, you know, if I'm not exceeding expectations, then I'm failing. And again, that, that's not at all true. I mean, that there's a huge, huge gap between failing and meeting expectations. You know, and perhaps exceeding expectations is something that, by definition, should be a little bit more rare. Um, disqualifying the positive. So you pass your boss in the hallway, and he tells you, you're doing a great job. And you think to yourself, you know, he's just being nice. There were people around. He had to say that. You're taking what is a good thing, a piece of positive feedback, and you're finding an excuse to throw it in the trash, to completely disregard it. Uh, mind reading when you're making assumptions about what other people are thinking. So let's say you're, you're in a meeting, you contribute an idea, and nobody comments. You think to yourself, like, they must all think I'm an idiot. Every, I mean, you have no idea what they're thinking or why they're not responding. You're making assumptions. Um, emotional reasoning is when we take our emotions sort of as fact and let that color our assessment of a situation. So m maybe a new, a new employee is brought onto your team and you're meeting them for the first time. And for whatever reason, you're, just, you're in a really good mood that day. You see, you're more likely to conclude that this person is, is competent, somebody you're excited to work with. 
if you would met that person on another day when you just happen to be in a bad mood, you're a lot more likely to feel like they're, they're not going to be a good member of the team, and you're going to dread working with them. And personal, personalization is when we tend to blame ourselves for the, the negative things happening around us. So maybe you notice your boss seems like he's in a bad mood today. Um, and your immediate thought is, is, this is all my fault. It must be something that I did to upset him. But again, you have no evidence to say that that's at all true. Um, so I think it's important to acknowledge these distortions, these inaccuracies in our thoughts. And I think the best way that we can do that is when we catch ourselves stuck in negative thinking, to just start off by asking these two very simple questions. Is this true, and is this helpful? In all those distorted thoughts, I mean, in many cases, they're, they're not true at all. And in most cases, they're not helpful. If, if your negative thought is true, it, you know, if, if you really did do something to upset your boss, and that's why he's in a bad mood, and if thinking about that is helpful, if it makes you feel maybe a little bit guilty and leads you to go and do something to repair the relationship, then that's probably a perfectly good thing. And you don't want to fight against that negative thought. Just listen to it and let it motivate you. But in the situations where our, our thoughts aren't true or aren't helpful, or in many cases, neither, then I think we, we need to do something else to start to push that negative thought away and to divert our attention to something else, um, which is the rest of these strategies we'll talk through. So first off, to distract. Um, you know, is focusing on this thought right now in my best interest? I mean, this, these set of strategies really work best when you catch yourself ruminating. So if you're the kind of person who does get stuck focusing on negative thoughts, this allows you to just sort of shift your attention to something else. Um, one way that really works to shift your attention is to get into what psychologists call flow. Which is, so flow is a state where you're fully immersed in an activity. Um, you, know, you sort of you feel kind of like you're, you know, time is sort of passing by and you're not even noticing it. If you guys have ever you know, been doing a hobby or an activity and you feel like it's been 15 minutes and you lift your head up and realize it's actually been an hour and a half, likely you've been in a flow state. Um, psychologists define flow by activities that sort of require us to meet a fairly high level of challenge, but where we also have a fairly high level of skill to meet that challenge. Right? So you can kind of see how you know, when we're in an activity that forces us to be fully present, to kind of keep focusing on the next step to move forward, you know, we're, not, we're not thinking much. We're sort of just engaged in the activity. Um, I mean, rock climbing tends to be one of the stereotypical examples people bring up. You can sort of imagine a rock climber on a wall who has to focus so intently on you know, maybe just shifting their weight a little bit and finding that next handhold. Um, there's a, a rock climber who I've, I've been following a bit more recently, uh, Alex Honnold. Uh, he's, uh, if you have seen, he has a new movie out right now. He, he free soloed, which means he climbed without any ropes whatsoever. Um, El Capitan here in Yosemite. Kind of a, a crazy, unprecedented feat in rock climbing. Um, and, and Alex Honnold calls what he uses sort of psychologically as, as this mental armor. He talks about this fact that, that when, he, when he's climbing, he's really in the zone, and that there's something protecting his head from thinking too much. Right? He, he's not self-evaluating. He's not thinking about how insane it is what he's doing. He's just fully engaged in the activity in the moment. Um, and those kinds of activities are a really great way to shift our focus from negative thoughts to the activity. Now, I just have a list here of things like work, exercise, art, music, games, hobbies, different ways that hopefully you can get into flow when the challenge meets your skills. So I would hope for a lot of you there are aspects of your work where you're able to get into a flow state. You know, maybe if you're a software developer and you're sort of deep in code trying to solve a problem, then you're likely to be in a flow state when you're really fully immersed and engaged in that activity. Um, so I just encourage you to find some ways for yourself or think about ways that you tap into flow states um, in your day. A second way to distract is to build positive emotion. Um, so negative emotions by definition, and especially negative emotions like anger and anxiety, what they do to us is they narrow our focus. Right? They sort of bring our attention onto a problem. Um, and positive emotions literally do the opposite, that they broaden our field of view and they make it a lot easier for us to step back from those feelings like we're stuck in a rut of negative thought. Um, I mean, I love the picture of the baby, perhaps as a way just to generate some positive emotion in itself. Um, things like humor, um, confidence, you know, ways to tap into those kinds of emotions, I think, are, are really 
fairly easy for us. I mean, I, I've got a, a handful of YouTube channels that I just sort of go to when I know I need a good laugh. Or if I can think about a situation when I felt particularly confident, and just sort of reflect on it, put myself back in that space and let that emotion kind of come back to me, that that can be a really effective way to fight back some negative thoughts. Um, and gratitude, in particular, is an emotion that has a lot of research showing its benefits for our well-being and our mental health. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunity for all of us to recognize how much we have around us to truly appreciate and to acknowledge the opportunities that maybe we take for granted. Um, and gratitude is, is so simple and straightforward yet powerful that I actually want to give you guys all a chance to just try this out and practice this skill right now. Um, so what I'm going to do is, is first I'm just going to ask you guys for, for a moment to reflect on the question, who am I grateful for? So whoever this is that comes to mind, maybe somebody that did something nice for you this week, or maybe somebody that's just had a, a significant impact on your life, who are you feeling grateful for today? And once you identify somebody, I'd like for you to turn to somebody else in the room and to share who you came up with and what it is about this person that you're feeling grateful for. Um, if, you, if you're watching this and joining remotely and you have somebody else you can turn to and talk about this with, that, that's great. Uh, if you're by yourself, uh, maybe just take a minute to grab a, a pen and paper or pull up a notepad on your computer and just sort of write down your thoughts. But I want to give you guys about three minutes right now just to talk quickly and share your moments in person of gratitude. I always hate shutting down those conversations, but I, but I hope that in just, I mean, that was two minutes maybe worth of thinking about somebody you're grateful for and then just taking a moment to share it and talk about it, that, that I'm hoping that you guys all sort of feel some of that emotion and, and how it, it can really shift your focus if you're feeling you know, in a bad mood or maybe focusing a lot in negative thinking. Um, I mean, gratitude in particular is a really great strategy to use at night. If you should find yourself ruminating on negative thoughts and you're trying to fall asleep, um, just sort of recounting maybe some people or some things that you're grateful for from the previous day can help you sort of kind of calm your body back down a little bit, shift your emotions, and help you fall asleep faster. Uh, a third distract strategy is to focus outward. Um, you know, so I think just to ideally take yourself out of your negative thinking, focus on helping somebody else. Uh, I mean, if you know somebody who could use a hand or just needs somebody who will listen to them for a moment, I think that can be one of the greatest ways to just get out of your own head. Um, I think a specific way that you can practice focusing on other people is to use what UCLA psychologist Shelley Gable calls active constructive responding. So what she researches is moments where people around us have had something good happen to them. They have some good news they want to share and talk about. And that when we engage in those stories and listen actively and ask questions and ultimately help them relive that experience, re-experience the emotion, that we both walk away with enhanced well-being and a strengthened relationship. So I, I think it's one way to just sort of get out of our own heads a little bit is to focus a bit more on finding the opportunities to help other people re-experience their good news by responding in a way that's active and constructive and allows them to re-experience that moment. So distraction techniques are... are are okay when we need to just sort of shift our focus. But a lot of times our negative thoughts, I think, are requiring a little bit more than that. So sometimes we need to combat them uh, and ask ourselves, is this negative thought worth taking at face value? Um, so one way we can do that is to prove it wrong. Um, and this is literally just drawing from sort of the massive research in cognitive behavioral therapy that's about taking thoughts that are untrue and finding a way to argue back against them by searching for the truth and providing the evidence to do that. So if, you know, if earlier this morning you gave a presentation 
And now you're just sort of walking around thinking, like, that presentation went horribly. But you don't have any evidence backing that thought up. It's just sort of a, it's just there. It's the way you feel about how things went. Now, you might be well served to, to prove that thought wrong. And one way you can do that is to just literally flip the phrase around and to argue, the presentation went well because, and to fill in the blanks, and to identify whatever specific, vivid piece of, of evidence you have to argue against it. And so you might think back to the presentation and say, you know, this presentation did go well because three people came up to me afterwards and had questions to ask, and they were obviously engaged in what I had to say. Or maybe th this presentation went well because I stuck to my plan and I communicated the issues clearly, concisely, and people got it. Right? Whatever it is, finding a way to really pull on that evidence can help us prove an untrue negative thought wrong. Um, one thing to be aware of is the confirmation bias while you're doing this. Um, the confirmation bias is, is just a psychological tendency that plays out for all of us all the time. That's there, it sort of operates in a way that it, it maintains the beliefs and worldviews that we currently have. So, so when you're thinking to yourself, the presentation didn't go well, right? And you, you sort of are you're endorsing and believing that as sort of your starting point. All the evidence that supports it not going well is going to be much more salient. Like, you're going to remember the two people who spent the whole presentation on their phones. And you're not thinking at all about the other 10 who were engaged and nodding their heads and looking like they were totally getting it. Right? Or you might, you might focus completely on the one person who got up and left the room right away, rather than the three people who came up and had questions for you. Um, so when you're trying to find the evidence against your thoughts, to recognize that, that there's this tendency pulling you constantly towards why your negative thought's true. So you have to put in a little bit extra effort sometimes to, to find that evidence against it. But I do think that the more you practice this, the better you can get at fighting that confirmation bias and thinking flexibly. Um, another way we can combat our thoughts is to reframe them. I mean, sometimes our thoughts you know, aren't exactly things that we can prove untrue. I mean, maybe you, know, you have a really long to-do list when you get into work tomorrow, and you just think to yourself, like, this is going to suck. Right? I mean, maybe we can't prove that as untrue exactly, but it's probably not going to help you get through your to-do list to focus on that thought. Um, so one thing that I like to recommend to people is to, to imagine somebody who you admire for their optimism. You know, somebody who is sort of constantly seeing silver linings and the things around them. And just sort of imagine for a moment, like, how would they be thinking about this situation? Um, I mean, for me in particular, like my wife is my model of this. Whenever I'm sort of stuck in this sort of, I see all the dark clouds stuff, she really does a good job at helping bring me back towards the silver linings. So like she might help me to, to see that, you know what, you have a lot on your plate today, but it's, it's an opportunity to prove what you're capable of, and you're probably going to learn a lot along the way. You know, and when you go through your day thinking about, what am I going to learn today, rather than how is today going to suck, you notice very different things, and you show up in completely different ways. So I think it's, it's important to acknowledge you know, when these thoughts aren't helping us, how can we reframe them in a way that makes them more productive? Um, lastly, and perhaps one of the most powerful strategies we can use against negative thinking is to distance ourselves. Now, these techniques generally um, are a little bit harder. They often require a little bit of practice for them to be really effective. Uh, but when you do practice them, I think they can probably be the best approach we have to conquering negative thinking. Um, and you know, we might just ask ourselves, should I let this negative thought determine my response at all? Does this thought even matter? Um, so the first way to think about distancing is to just let the thought pass. Um, if any of you are practicers of, of meditation, um, I mean, meditation is, is exactly about allowing a thought to come into our awareness and then pass it back away. Um, in, in Buddhist philosophy, or there's a, a concept of us having this monkey mind, right? That when we actually tune into what our minds are doing all day long, we start to recognize that these thoughts are just sort of flitting everywhere out of control. Um, and we often aren't even aware of it because we're just sort of engrossed in taking the thoughts as truth and living our lives. Um, so I mean, this, this picture that I have up of a, a lifeguard chair on a beach is one that came to me when I was first learning to meditate and back with my rowing coach back when I was in college that I, I sort of just started meditating and after a while kind of saw myself climbing up sort of in this lifeguard chair type thing 
where I could see below me, just far enough away, my thoughts that were sort of playing out, doing their crazy things, but that, that I myself was actually just a little bit separated from those thoughts. Right? And that started over time to give me a little bit of perspective that I, I could sort of acknowledge a thought as being there, but it's not me, and I don't have to let it drive my behavior or my emotion in the moment. Um, I mean, to be frank with you, I, I think it, it took me time to really build that. I mean, I think the first time I, I did it, it felt like that lifeguard tower didn't even have any rungs to get up to the top. It's like it, it, it took time for that to become something that I was able to switch my mindset into. But, but after a while, it was something that I was able to do outside meditation, right? That just in the moment of thinking negatively, that you start to recognize that you can just observe, observe those thoughts as just thoughts, and they don't have to drive your reactions. Um, I mean, mindfulness practices are sort of very similar where we don't necessarily have to be mindful and observant about what's going on in our minds. I mean, we could go and have lunch and practice having a mindful lunch where we're just really noticing the sensory perceptions while we eat. You know, what does our food really taste like and smell like? But sort of allowing ourselves to just sort of be an observer of our experience. That, that can give you that same distance over time if you practice it. Um, and ACT is a, an acronym for Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, which Sort of, if you're interested in this line of thinking, we're very similar. Um, where you know the, the philosophy behind ACT is that we we sort of allow our thoughts to come into our awareness, but not dictate our response. You know that, that our choice of behavior is different than the thought showing up. Uh, a second way we can distance ourselves is to just write about our thoughts. Um, there's a lot of research on expressive writing, and how just putting our thoughts on paper generally can help us deal with stress. Uh, and improve our mood. Um, and in particular, when, when people write about adversities or challenges in their lives, that the ability to, to just find meaning in those experiences becomes a lot easier. Right? And, and I think the basic idea here is just, just by putting your thoughts on paper, getting them out of your head, you're able to just step back that little bit and to reflect on them in a way that can help you process um, and find different interpretations. Um, and when, one way in particular that you guys might try to write or journal, especially when you're stuck in a pattern of negative thinking, is to do what we call a self-compassion letter. Well, what you do is just sort of, you imagine that you're writing a letter to a good friend of yours who's being too hard on themselves, but the friend that you're writing to is actually yourself. And so you might write it in the second person. You know, that like, I think you should be you know, aware that you're being too hard on yourself lately. You know, you've been doing a really good job. Whatever that is, to, to, to write yourself a letter that engages the emotion of compassion and forgiveness for yourself. Um, and they've done sort of research on, you know, when people go through experiences of failure or sort of have an adversity where things don't go well, that people who can feel a sense of compassion for themselves um, do much better at sort of working through it and, and approaching another adversity much better. And finally, and I think maybe just one of the most subtle and interesting ways we can distance ourselves from negative thoughts is just to act anyway. Um, and one of the sort of the meditation teachers who, who's sort of really popular in psychology who studied meditation in the West is John Kabat-Zinn. And, and he talks about how we are not our thoughts. And, and I think if you take that notion far enough, I mean, you recognize that whatever we're thinking in a moment, doesn't necessarily have to drive at all how we behave or how we show up, right? And I think that this, this Vincent van Gogh quote, if you hear a voice within you say you cannot paint, then by all means paint and that voice will be silenced, is one that carries a lot of weight when we're trying to overcome negative thoughts. Um, like I've always found, I think, one of just the maybe cruelest practical jokes of our psychology is that when we're trying to do something that's a little intimidating, or maybe brings up some fear or anxiety for us, a lot of times what we're wanting to feel in that moment is confident. But in reality, the way our psychology works is that we do the thing, we prove to ourselves that we can, and the confidence comes after the fact. You know, so that over time, we can build confidence and grow, but in a way, our ability to just find a conviction to act anyway, like, yeah, I'm afraid. Yeah, I don't want to do this right now, but I can and I will, and that at the tail end of it, that confidence and belief in yourself starts to come over time. Um, so just to review, um, you know, so we've got our strategies of assess, distract, combat, and distance, 
as I mentioned up front, I mean, no one of these is going to work perfectly for all of you. So I think you know, experimenting some and, and finding the ones that, that really do help you in the moment uh, is sort of an individual experience. And you may have to just play around a bit to find those that, that do help. Um, I want to punctuate that, that all of these strategies we're talking about are sort of ways you can manage thoughts yourself. Um, and if, if these help and they get you far enough down the field towards avoiding your negative thoughts and sort of feeling the feelings that come from them, that's fantastic. Um, but you absolutely do not have to fight all of your negative thinking on your own. I mean, if these strategies alone are not helping you, I just want to make a very clear statement that there are resources and people who are wanting to help and are willing to help. I mean, I know here, uh, for you folks working at Google and YouTube, you've got folks in the EAP or people at, at Go Mental Health who can be these resources when maybe you've tried some of this stuff and, and it's not working on its own, or at least who can help you apply some of this stuff in a way that, that does work better for you. Um, so I just want to encourage everybody who's listening, if you find yourself stuck in negative thinking, you don't have to go it alone. Um, I do want to share with you guys um, some of what Happify has to offer around this. So Happify is a platform um, where we sort of teach and sort of take you through a lot of the skills and strategies we've just discussed, where you can practice and begin to kind of get facility with, with all of these different ways of enhancing your well-being, avoid negative thoughts, you know, to be more productive in your work, you name it. Um, so you guys can go to Go Happify, and you'd be brought straight to this sign-up page. Um, and I just kind of want to walk you through the site for a minute or two. Um, if you were to click Start Your Journey, you, know, you would just sort of get an initial assessment here that includes some questions. Um, you know, do you have a hard time bouncing back after adversity? Sort of a, a few other just kind of assessments of your psychology. Um, and based on your assessment, we're going to recommend some tracks for you right off the bat. Um, so, You'll see that Conquer Your Negative Thoughts is a track that, that I created a few years ago where, I mean, basically everything we've talked about today is embedded in this track that if this is one you wanted to select for yourself, you could go through and practice all of these skills in a guided way. Um, and again, so if you click on a track, these tracks are, are, are developed so that they take place over about a four-week time period. They're sort of chunked into four different parts to make sure that you know, you're taking on sort of a sizable piece at any given time. So if you were to jump in and start part one, you'd see a few activities there uh, on that activities list, um, things like uplift or smell the roses. Um, an activity like thanks, thanks, thanks is one of the first ones you'd see here, which is an exercise of gratitude, similar to what we just practiced together. You know, we're, we're just sort of asking you to think about three good things that happened to you today and why you feel grateful for them. And you would sort of just fill this in. Um, you can also just explore our tracks openly, so you don't have to do the recommended ones. And we have featured tracks, and we also have tracks blocked out by category. Um, so you notice things like health and well-being or relationships. Um, we have a category on work and money that if you were to click in there, you'd find all kinds of tracks uh, on how to be a more mindful leader, how to develop grit, uh, how to feel more energized about your job. And again, all of these tracks are you know four-week um, sort of you know, courses that take you through a variety of sort of positive psychology skills to move you towards these goals. Um, a few other things that you just would find on Happify's site in addition to the tracks is, is what we call Happify Daily, um, sort of just a, a content media post uh, on stories and videos which are just sort of good news things. Like if you're in that place where you want to distract for a moment and find something to uplift you, um, there's plenty of things here on Happify Daily that will just put you in a better mood. And, and remind you that there's plenty of good in this world, um, despite not always seeing it. Uh, we have a community page with different forums where you can go in and, and sort of just chat with other folks about your struggles, your successes with these different, um, different activities. Um, you can also share posts with the community at large. Um, there's an instant play section where even outside of a track, you can just go in and do these activities. Um, if you were to click on guided meditation, for example, now these are all meditations that are embedded in different tracks throughout the site. But you can just go in directly and choose a meditation. Um, and you'll get you know, one of the leading sort of uh, facilitators in, in meditation, people like, like Sharon Salzberg, for example, will guide you through a meditation towards a specific end. You can just play around with these uh, freely. Um, there's also um, games on the site that have been designed to help 
enforce the psychology interventions. So things like, like Uplift is a game where you're trying to focus on balloons that have positive words rather than negative words. And your score is going to increase over time if you're able to sort of you know, pop the balloons with positive and avoid the ones with negative. You know, so just sort of subtly training your mind to focus more on the good than the bad. Um, and there's a, you know, a, a sort of assessment section. You can sort of keep track of your happiness score. Um, and you can also sort of follow your, your assessments over time and, and track your well-being. Um, again, I do want to just say in closing that you know, negative thoughts are, are part of our human experience, as I said up front. Um, I don't think our goal in any of this stuff is to stop ourselves from thinking negatively. I mean, we're humans. These thoughts are going to arise for us. And, and no matter what we do, at times they're going to get in our way. But to find just small ways where we can acknowledge that we're not alone, we all think this way at times, and that when we're really finding ourselves stuck, that we have plenty of strategies or hopefully plenty of people in our lives we can turn to who can help us through it. So I wish you guys the best of luck with it. Yeah, and do you guys have any, any questions, too, before we close? I'm happy to, to do any Q&A for a few minutes. Yeah. I have kind of a silly question. Yeah. Um, one of the techniques you talk about in terms of letting thoughts pass is to write it down. Mm -hmm. um, is there a difference between writing it down on paper and pen and writing it down like electronically? Because I'm thinking like it might be nice during the work day if stuff comes up to just like on the computer since I'm there already yeah. to write it down there. Um, but I don't know if, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, so I think I'll answer sort of twofold. I mean, I think the process of writing down your thoughts in any way is going to gain you some distance and some ability to reflect. But I will say that most of the research on sort of the power of journaling and writing really does take place with like a pen or pencil on paper, where I mean, you're not only just sort of writing the thoughts, but I mean, you're literally creating the words in a page. And I think that, I mean, if, if for no other reason than it's, it's easier to type on your computer, then grab a pen and a piece of paper. I mean, if, if you don't have access to it, I mean, I think still writing is going to help. But by all means, I think to do it on paper is, is probably going to serve you better. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll ask a question from the Dory, and then if anyone in here has another one, we can do that. Um, with current proliferations of meditation, like Headspace and GCOM, is there a risk of users with anxiety or mental health issues, mild or severe, not addressing issues and instead suppressing them via meditation, as opposed to approaching them with trained professionals or at least CBT apps at home? Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's a fantastic question. Um, I think... I think that the answer ultimately may be sort of dependent person by person and on context. But I, I will just sort of highlight again that first strategy I talked about was to assess. Where before we do any of these other things, I think it's important to look at the negative thoughts for just a moment and to say, is this true? Is, is this a helpful thought? Is, is there something here that I, I need to, to put my attention on? Right? Because if, if in many cases our negative thoughts are sort of trying to give us messages to act and respond in a certain way, if all we do is sort of turn that aside and ignore it, then absolutely we can sort of create problems that we're not addressing. But I, I think when we acknowledge that our thoughts aren't true and aren't helping us, that generally meditation is a fantastic approach to help us manage anxiety um, and some of those thoughts that are really just getting in our way. I have three more Dory questions, but yes. So if we want to become more of an optimist, um, what would you say is like the first step? Like how would you start? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a great question. I mean, there's, there's a lot of research specifically on like how optimists think and what they do in inverse situations. Um, but I think just flat out, the, the key is that optimists identify what they can control. So, so I think to practice thinking more like an optimist, the next time you find yourself in a situation that's maybe frustrating, or maybe you're feeling impatient, uh, maybe you're feeling anxious, to, to train your mind to immediately focus on something you can do to improve the situation, even if it's at, at the very least just internally, to improve your emotions and how you're feeling, that what an optimist does is finds those points of control and leverages the heck out of those. So, so I think that alone is going to get you like, pretty far in terms of shifting your thinking into a more optimistic style. OK, another Dory question. How do you balance managing negative thoughts without settling or accepting situations that you should not be? For example, if in a bullying work environment or an unhappy personal relationship, such as a marriage, you definitely want to manage thoughts, but you may want to maintain your standards. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think this, this, I think, just goes back to the skill of assessing first, right? I mean, if you're having negative thoughts that are 
that are honest and true thoughts about a very hard situation you may be facing. I mean, the situations in life aren't always easy. I mean, we, sort of, we all acknowledge it as human beings. If, if you're in a situation that's not healthy for you, the negative thoughts that are bubbling up around that are, are I think, a clear message that's telling you you have to do something. So, so those are not the thoughts that we want to fight back against or try to avoid. I think the more that we can tune into those and allow them to guide our, our responses, the better. OK, last story question is, how can people relieve stress and dread about things that are or feel truly unchangeable? For example, a project that you know you cannot finish on time, an exam you know you are not prepared for, a deadline that you just realized you missed that will adversely affect you. Great, yeah. So I think, so this kind of goes back again to what an optimistic thinking style is really about, sort of acknowledging those things we can't control and letting those things pass. Now, first off, I think in those examples, something like a test you're not feeling prepared for, well, by all means, I mean, even if the test is in an hour, an hour is a lot of room to do something that you have control over. So I would say an optimist, first and foremost, wouldn't let that thought go. They would do something to prepare themselves as much as they could in an hour. But if it's something you really don't have control over, I think the skills of distancing, you know, to, to write about it and journal about it, or to, to, to find a mindfulness or meditation practice where you can just sort of let these thoughts come into your awareness and then acknowledge, I, I can't do anything about this. Whatever emotions are coming up around this are there, but I'm just going to let them pass. And again, shift my attention more towards what I can do to improve my situation to get myself into a healthy place. Thank you guys very much.